Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Surge Podcast. My name is Saud, and today I'll be talking about awkward intubations, uh, field intubations, namely situations where you weren't expecting to intubate, but you have to intubate, and you can't get the correct positioning, correct lighting, or anything else for that matter. And, you know, these things should never happen. You never expect them to happen. But when they do happen, it's nice to be prepared. And that's why I figured I'd talk about it. Plus, I got asked a very uh, difficult question the other day that I didn't have the answer to. Um, so when you look at areas of concern or areas where you're just not comfortable intubating, the first one is uh, if you have to coat a patient that's physically flat on the floor and that you can't move onto a stretcher. You know, typically that happens if you have C-spine precautions or if you're in the middle of an airport and the patient's actively desaturating or things like that. The second most common reason uh, is probably because you're a paramedic and the patient's trapped in the vehicle. And from the outset, you know, uh, these are people who have a specific expertise in recovery and therefore they tend to find less challenging than you or I would because we kind of do this part-time compared to them. We're never really actively deployed for more than, I'd say, three or four months at a time. And these guys do it 24-7, 365. Uh, so they have a different level of expertise. But nevertheless, if you have a patient that's trapped in a vehicle and can't support their airway or support their ventilation for whatever reason, it's another reason to, to attempt an intubation. And we're going to talk about that too. And the third is if you're in a closed space, whether it's an ambulance or whether it's in air transport, on an air ambulance, for example, or if you're on a train, or if the patient's incumbent upon you. And we're going to talk about these things fairly uh, briefly. Uh, if I skip over something, please let me know, but I'm trying to make this as high yield as possible. So first, let's talk about what we mean by, by rescue or field uh, resuscitations. So field resuscitation or rescue in my opinion, is its own specialty, filed under EMS. You have various different subsets, including rope rescue, where these guys learn how to air rappel down, uh, intubate a person, slab in some IVs, and then rappel back up again and recover them onto a landing site, for example. Water rescue, uh, where you're working through fast-flowing rivers and drains and aqueducts. Search and rescue, where it's a huge catchment area, and they have to effectively survey it in a manner whereby they're guaranteed to get maximal yield in the minimum amount of time. And it's extremely uh, challenging to do that type of thing and, and is very resource sensitive. Confined space rescue where you can't get the patient out and getting them out would require a lot of hardware and maybe potentially some explosives. Firefighting and rescue where there is an emphasis not on putting out the fire necessarily, but on delaying the spread of the fire until everybody's out and you can put it out definitively without making the building collapse. And, and that's like a, a fine line. And it really is admirable when you see it. And I, I've seen these things once or twice now. And, you know, it, it's, it's phenomenal what you tend to see. Then there's heavy rescue. And these involve extremely high impact, what would be considered non-salvageable industrial accidents. Rescue from collapsed structures, and finally tactical rescue. And these are the military missions involving rescue, and oftentimes uh, maybe civilian non-combatants as well. And it, it, there's a different way of training people for that. It's considered parallel training with other specialties, whether it's in the medical field or in the military martial field. And, you know, it's not an area that I have a particular expertise in, but I find it ridiculously interesting. And, you know, if anybody out there can give a talk on it, I'd greatly appreciate it. When you look at uh, field rescue officers on a scene that looks like this, um, the first thing that they have to do is they have to perform a scene assessment. And they have to look at the feasibility of staying and playing versus scooping and running. How much they can do on the scene definitively and how much they'd have to defer for when they get the patient out. The second thing that they have to do is that they have to manage any hazards in the area and they have to work as a team towards that. The third is to gain access to the patient and create a space amount them, around them in order to gain full access. Once they have full access, they can actually make a decision whether to extricate the patient or to begin to actually treat them. And 
Apart from that, their assessment of an airway is almost parallel with any standard EMS. And the standard EMS is sort of a direct extension, if you will, of our abilities in, in a resuscitation room as, as physicians and physician assistants and nurses. So it, it all comes together, more or less. But the key emphasis here, if you're in this situation as a non-expert in rescue, is that you have to clear the area, you have to assess the situation, you have to create an environment that's safe for the patient to be extricated, and then you can begin your resuscitation on the field. And for the sake of today, we're not going to be talking about field rescue per se. I can do a separate talk on that one day. But we're going to be talking about how to address the concern of positioning to intubate these patients and what to expect when doing it. And sort of the way that I got the insight towards this was I went to some courses and then um, I practiced on mannequins in our local sim center back where I trained. And, and, you know, having access to a simulation center, you know, I think that the literature will show far and beyond is a cornerstone towards training in 2020. But before I get into that, I can't emphasize this enough. If you want to save a life, learn to use an LMA. The LMA is your best rescue device. It's minimally invasive. It's less stressful to use than most of the other adjuncts, such as a surgical airway. And they're freely available. And although there's a printed expiry date, something tells me that that ain't true. Now, let's look at the scenario where we have a physically arrested patient on the floor. When you look at the literature, there are different ways to approach this. The most familiar to you as somebody who intubates regularly in the operating room or the ICU, or maybe even the resuscitation room, is uh, to have them in a splayed fashion on the floor. But when you look at the way that paramedics train for these things, they train for various different scenarios and various different needs. And we're going to look at some of these today. So this is what I would call the intuitive response from an anesthetist, surgeon, or critical care physician, or emergency doctor who regularly intubates and is comfortable with it. You want to get the view that you're used to, and that involves literally laying down on your belly in the prone position and attempting to intubate the patient. Now, the problem with this is simply the ergonomics. You cannot recruit the muscles required to lift up the jaw and to lift up the tongue. And there have been studies on, on the ergonomics of intubation. It requires a bit of force, about 120 Ps, more or less, right? 120 to 170 male to female ratio. But, you know, it takes a bit of work for you to be able to safely lift up and get that view. But the good thing is that your view is pretty well oriented with your epiglottis at around 90 degrees. The next best view is thought to be the lateral decupitus view when you're a non-expert. And the reason why people find the lateral decupitus view just as good is because to an extent, it mimics what you do in real life. It mimics what you're doing when the patient's on a table or a stretcher, right? Now, bear in mind that you, you have to be able to put your laryngoscope to get a sort of 20 degree diagonal view with your epiglottis at around 11 o'clock. But you have to put your tube in at 90 degrees. Right, and, and that's a little bit challenging because you'll feel a little bit disoriented and you'll think that you're going into the esophagus. You're not. It's just your view's distorted by the way that you're applying the force for similar reasons to the ones that I'd mentioned prior. You can't recruit the muscle without pulling diagonally. You'd have to use your brachioradialis uh, in order to be able to lift enough to get an adequate view. Similarly with the right lateral decupitus view. I find that the right lateral decupitus is used mainly because people are left-handed or vice versa, but you get the same problem. And I've practiced these, and I, I can tell you, I feel a lot of pressure on the elbow, and it's not nice. I almost feel like I'm doing uh, an isometric sort of crunch type of thing, like I'm working on my abs at the gym, and I hate going to the gym. Everybody who knows me knows this. The, the, the third view that's been described in the literature is called the sitting view. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of these. But the good thing about the sitting view is it actually makes it easier to see. And at the same time, you're supporting the neck with your leg. And using your leg actually orients you. The key problem with the sitting view, however, is that your ability to uh, perform the intubation and to directly visualize is related to a lot of patient-related factors. You're not going to get to your standard sniffing position. 
This is going to be sort of like a C-spine precaution intubation almost, right? Because of the way that your head is oriented, not because of the way that the patient's oriented. The uh, straddle view is uh, one of my favorites, and I'll explain why in a second. So bad things about it first, the negative first. The negative part of it is that you're going to get an inverted view. As you can see, your epiglottis is literally at 6 o'clock. The good thing about it is the way that you lift, you can recruit all the muscles in your pec and in your uh, scapular region. So you really get some good traction, and that gives you the best option for intubation. And as you're pulling, you can run your ET tube in parallel and still directly visualize, which is a lot harder to do from a view like this one. The minute your ET tube is in, your view is slightly obscured. And I'll get to why that's a problem by the end of the talk. But the straddle view, for me, is extremely comfortable. Um, it's sort of like a neon belly position from jujitsu. I know most of you don't know what jujitsu is you can look it up but it's literally a neon belly view and the the fact that you have yourself positioned in that manner means that you can maintain c-spine stabilization as well so uh, the comparison of these views has been made and uh, what's very interesting is that when you look at it they're all the same in terms of time to intubate right and they're all the same in terms of um your ability to perform the procedure. However, comfort, first pass intubation, and view that you get, the Malampati score, or the, sorry, not the Malampati score, but the Cormac Lehane score for the view, uh, seem to be better by far with the straddle view. It's not the best study. It's only a couple of, pay, of uh, residents working with a, with a, a mannequin, more or less. But it does seem to be far more um, efficient to use the straddle view if you've practiced it. So I would say practice all of them. Uh, I certainly did for a very long time. Every now and then I still do. Um, we have our own CPR dummy in our unit. And every now and then I'll, I'll practice these positions on it just to make sure that I can do it correctly and orient myself accordingly. Now, you will see weird and wonderful other ways of doing it that seem more comfortable. And this is something I picked up online, was apparently in resuscitation around 2003, I think. And, you know, I find it very hard to believe that somebody requires intubation if they're sitting there cross-legged. That's right off the bat. I also find it hard to believe that you're going to attempt to intubate somebody without wearing gloves. And uh, clearly, um, you know, it, it, it's not the best option it looks nice I agree with you but I've never intubated somebody from the side I've put in central lines from the side and if I'm going to be intubating somebody on the ground during an arrest I want to get a position that I know is secure that allows me to use all of my muscles comfortably and allows me to get the best view positive uh, po possible it's like the difficult airway talk I gave earlier you want the, your best chance to be your first chance and so I, I thoroughly would recommend that you research what you're going to be practicing and what you're going to introduce clinically before doing it. Something like this, I'll be very honest with you, it might work for some people, it doesn't work for me, especially without the gloves. Next, we'll move on to the stuck in the car problem or the pre extra creation problem. When you look at the literature, all of the studies have been done on mannequins, and these are sporadic studies, and it's, it's, it's a similar situation for a lot of airway data. Um, we tend to use mannequins for emergency uh, data. And when you look at it, typically your first line is going to be um, accessing uh, the passenger seat and then lowering uh, the seat to the back, the front seat to the back, almost turning it into a stretcher. I've tried this in real life. It works phenomenally. I swear to God, it's the best thing ever. It's almost like I'm intubating on a stretcher. It's like I'm intubating a bariatric person on a ramped position. It's extremely comfortable, actually. Uh, your second line is to do it through uh, the window or the car door, so-called face-to-face intubation. I've tried that. Um, I got it, but I found it very challenging. I, I did get the airway in, but I found it challenging. Your third line, and I would argue if you don't do this for a living, it should be your first line is an LMA. Keeping an LMA in the car is a smart thing to do, in my opinion. Just have one or two of them in the car, even if you pay for them yourself. 
A surgical airway is your last resort, and having done surgical airways before, I can tell you I would not be comfortable. Even as an expert, I would not be comfortable. Or somebody who's thought of as an expert, personally I don't think of myself as an expert, but whatever. I would not be comfortable doing it. While the person's in the car, hemodynamically unstable, with extremely low oxygen saturation. I personally would find it extremely challenging. right? And remember, safety first. If the car is burning, if something like that's happening, make sure that you call in expertise and help that can help you with the situation. And then we're going to talk a little bit about other options. So uh, this is through the passenger seat. As you can see, beautiful view is what you're going to get. Um, the one thing that I'd say is try and lower the seat from the front as well. And typically to access the passenger seat, as you can see, what you typically do is you're going to break the glass and put a towel over it or a blanket or the paramedic blankets. Uh, through the window, you're going to be able to see. But to see, you have to take a step back. It's, it's a very awkward view. It's like a sort of two o'clock epiglottis type of situation. But you will be able to see. And to get the tube in, it's similar uh, to what we we're talking about from the right lateral decubitus position. And that you're going to want to get the tube in at 90 degrees while pulling diagonally, which is it's a bit challenging. You know, it'll take a couple of dry runs to do. And lastly, when we're talking about confined spaces, so the confined spaces that I've been in where I've had to address the airway um, for multiple reasons. Listen, sometimes it's dislodgement, sometimes it's the you know, things happen while you're flying. Sometimes it's anaphylaxis. You never know what's going to happen. Have always been either through air transport for uh, air ambulances or while intubating on a ambulance. Very rarely, I've heard of people having to do this, but I personally haven't. Very rarely does it happen because you're in a confined space yourself. Usually in 2020, if you can get into that confined space, they can get the patient out. The professionals can get the patient out. So um, first is the modified straddle position. I've highlighted where you ha should have your knee. It's sort of a combo between the straddle and the sit in that you have your knee right under their, their um, interscrapular line, parallel to it, and you can get a good snouting position from there. And then that gives you an excellent view to be able to intubate. Your second option is to use video laryngoscopy and try and do it face to face. Now, my issue with video laryngoscopy is if you're going to use it in a semi-sitting position, it's it's going to be a bit of a problem to get your stylet out afterwards because there's a lot of resistance. It's very similar to the problem of recruiting while uh, sitting in the prone position and intubating on the floor. Lastly, uh, what seems to be coming in the literature more and more is the use of flexible endoscopy when you're in these situations and when you're in the car. I think that for trauma, it's a bit of a problem. Personally, I don't like flexible endoscopy because uh, the lens keeps getting covered up with blood. Hopefully, we'll see a paper soon proving that video laryngoscopy is superior to flexible endoscopy in these cases, but I'm not holding my breath. Lastly, you have to recognize, no matter what technique you use, even after tube check, because you're in transport and because it's a difficult situation in which you're going to have to transport a patient, the tube might get dislodged. Now, this has been studied on mannequins and cadavers. And what seems to happen is that because your intubation position is awkward, as you're pulling your intubating device out, whether it's a video laryngoscope or a CMAC or a galidoscope or a regular laryngoscope or even a McCoy, you rub against the tube and you dislodge it or you perforate the balloon. So it's very important when you're pulling out the tube to double check with capnography afterwards and to double check the tube position after you've taken out your laryngoscope. I think that that's key because you don't have an x-ray when you're on the field and you really don't want to transport somebody with an esophageal intubation. Now, the future, I think, is in video laryngoscopy, no matter where you are, whether you're on the field or not. And here are the reasons why, my non-evidence-based reasons why. The evidence-based ones are clearly up there. I've just put up three papers over the past five years. Each paper has included more and more patients. Each paper has included more and more candidates as it has increased in power. Initially, we had correspondences being done, asking for randomized controlled trials. Now we know for a fact, whether it's in the critical care literature, anesthesia literature, trauma literature, or uh, emergency medicine literature, 
no matter what label you carry while you're doing your resuscitation, the reality is just set in. Video laryngoscopy is superior. That's the first reason. The outcomes are better, first pass intubation rates are better, and it's easier for you to pick up, and it's easier for you to be coached and helped out. Two, second reason, they're getting cheaper. So video laryngoscopes, when I first started, used to be about, I would say, between five and ten thousand dollars, depending on what you got and whatever. Flexible, forget about it. You're talking about a Mercedes Benz here, if not a Porsche. Nowadays, they're between a thousand six hundred dollars, and this was over the course of less than ten years. So this tells you that over time, this is going to be the standard, especially the mobile ones like these. They're perfect, and they're dirt cheap, right? They're extremely cheap, relatively speaking. So I think that this is going to be the future. One last thing. I got asked about how to intubate blindly using the fingers. My answer to this is don't intubate blindly using the fingers. Digital intubation has been described since the 1980s. It has not been demonstrated effectively since then, in my humble opinion. You're going to end up cutting your fingers on the patient, exposing yourself to risks of infection. You're going to end up feeling uh, senses of remorse if the tube is dislodged or not in the right place. And because you haven't felt around in the area, you'd find it very difficult. You know, I think if you really had to do it, and if you really knew your anatomy, and you're used to intubating the esophagus with endoscopes or something like that, like you genuinely do this every day, it would be justifiable to do a digital intubation. But I'm going to tell you, I haven't seen any paper be as passionate about it as they were in the first paper that described in the 1980s. And we keep forgetting that back in the 80s, we didn't really have very strong data on anything. Right? And so anything was better than nothing. This was the time before we had rapid sequence intubation, before we actually understood indications for intubation per se, when expertise was, was at, its, at its beginnings, I would say, is the best way of putting it. And now we've reached a point where an era where we have the technology, we have LMAs, we have surgical airway kits that are percutaneous, we have extremely high resolution video laryngoscopes. We really shouldn't be using these things. So... Lastly, uh, just as closing thoughts, if you think you need to intubate, intubate prior to transport. It shouldn't be an unexpected event. If you're on the field and you haven't drilled it and you haven't trained on it on a simulator, just put in an LMA. You can treat the aspiration pneumonia if it happens, but you've saved a life. Surgical airways do work. They're a good adjunct. They're a good resort, last resort device. But you're going to need to learn how to do them. And I might do a talk on how to train somebody for a surgical airway, like how to make a homemade simulator and stuff. I haven't decided yet. Field intubations work. If you have a plan, you can practice them. Okay? They do work. So EMS guys do them consistently, and there's good data that successful intubations have occurred. The outcomes of patients who are intubated aren't that much better or worse, but that's an argument for another day. But they are doable. The straddle position is probably the best. And getting used to using video-assisted intubation is a good idea right now, especially if you're still in training, because it's likely to become the standard soon. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, be sure to subscribe, please.